Everyone involved with this presentation would defend people's right to worship or not worship as they please. If someone wants to devote themselves to Jesus or Aphrodite or nature or money or pleasure or a political ideology or themselves, both the God of the Bible and our Constitution give them that freedom. I've got to go into a meeting, 10 minutes. Uh, the Fed's getting ready to announce whether or not they're going to raise rates. I need to be there. If Trinidad calls, tell them if IBM gets a 64, they need to put a market order in for 2,000 shares. That's very important that they know that. Oh, wait a minute. Make sure that I have 20 copies of the latest edition of Milton Friedman's book about capitalism in America. I've got to give those to my clients. But devotion to a particular ideology means embracing and being faithful to a specific set of beliefs. No true communist, for example, would support making a living from buying and selling stocks. Neither would they tolerate the teachings of Adam Smith or Milton Friedman. A person who did such things would simply be labeled, for the sake of clarity and definition, a capitalist or an anti-communist. Well, in precisely the same way, no person or organization can call itself Christian if they don't embrace the central tenets that gave rise and definition to the term Christian. And if they actively deny those tenets or refer to anyone who does believe them as being wrong or deceived, they can be fairly termed antichrist. I can't believe that you won't accept me as a Christian. Uh -huh. I mean, look at the good that Mormons do. Yeah, it's the but same good that Christ taught us to no, do. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. And more, hold on. More importantly, I believe in Christ. Yeah, okay. And well, I believe well, that well, He died you, on the cross for my sins. Yeah, James. you say you believe in Christ. The latter day saints say they believe in Christ, but it's a different Christ than the one the Bible teaches. I mean, you believe in a Christ that dies for a much different reason. I completely disagree with you. And in fact, I think that's nitpicking. That's it's all not. That is. It's not nitpicking. Okay, what if I were to put it this way? What if somebody or myself <laughs> sincerely believed? that the angel Lucifer came down, visited the prophetess Josephine Smith, ah, Josephine Smith, Josephine okay. Smith took her to That's some good. lead tablets that were written by the king of Atlantis. It's crazy. Okay, I know it's crazy, but I'm making a point, so let me finish and you'll understand. Okay. What if those tablets said that Christians are supposed to hang out until the end of time, wait for Christ's return so they can rule their own planet someday as gods, right? Mm -hmm. In the meantime, they're supposed to abstain from sex and become fruitarians. Okay, if I sincerely believe, where was this here? If I sincerely believe that, would you consider me a Mormon? Of course not. Okay, and why not? The Church of Latter-day Saints doesn't teach that, doesn't expect us to believe in any kind of nonsense like well, that. Well, except for the part of ruling your own planet as gods. But that's my point, is the Bible has some very specific foundational things that are expected to be believed, and the Mormons have veered away from those. In fact, in some cases, it's the exact opposite. That's why I can love you like a friend, and I do, but you and I can't be considered brothers in Christ. It should be obvious if you think about it. Claiming to be a Christian doesn't make you a true follower of Christ any more than calling yourself a vegetarian makes you one regardless of what you believe or do. In order to be a Christian, you must submit yourself completely to Christ and believe the Bible and its teachings. The second reason we must know the marks of a cult and not be afraid to use the label is that we are commanded by scripture to protect the apostolic faith and to condemn any misrepresentations of the Lord Jesus and his word. Almost every one of the New Testament books addresses the need to speak the truth and to avoid error. The only way you can avoid error is by identifying it and by saying it's wrong in comparison with this standard. The word Christian means something. Um, Christianity has always been associated with a certain belief system, with a world view, uh, that there is one God who exists in three persons, who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ, and that revelation is recorded for us in the Holy Scriptures that have been passed down by other Christians through the church for 2,000 years. As it says in Jude, uh, that uh, we are to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. So the Christian faith has a certain set of beliefs that, uh, that uh, comprise what it means to be a Christian. And if someone believes something that contradicts that set of beliefs or it somehow goes beyond what that set of beliefs uh, is all about, then, then by definition they have departed from that Christian faith. 
For the true Christian, defending the faith is not an option. It's a solemn responsibility. There are several verses that make this clear, but let's consider a few points found in the third verse of the book of Jude. Beloved, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. First, note that Jude says the faith and not faiths. There is only one holy apostolic faith. Next, we can see that Jude describes this faith as being once for all delivered to the saints. This means that it's universal and immutable or unchangeable, that nothing is to be added to or taken away. There will never be a need to revise the faith in some way in order to make it more relevant to a particular people or generation. Finally, we are commanded to contend in the original Greek to epagonizomi, to struggle earnestly, to strive for this holy, immutable, apostolic faith. He is addressing all believers. And when he says that we are to, uh, to contend for the faith, he uses a word that's extremely descriptive. It's the, the term that eventually comes into our language as agonize. Well, we are to agonize for the faith, the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. This means that there will be those who will attempt to twist and pervert the faith. We have a holy obligation to actively resist and expose their doctrine as false and ultimately satanic. And as we'll see, this earnest defense of the faith isn't directed so much at pagan belief systems, though there's certainly a place for that as well. No, the apostles were far more concerned about heretical beliefs that would spring up from within the church. Teachings that had the appearance of being Christian and biblical, but were in reality distortions of the truth. For I know this, Paul said, that after my departure, savage wolves would come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. There will be false teachers among you. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. It is not surprising then if his, speaking of Satan, servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Over 25 times in the New Testament alone, God warns us about the potential for deception from Satan, from false teachers, and from within ourselves. In fact, there are few things in scripture that are emphasized more. Understanding this innate and ever-present susceptibility to deception, we must be all the more vigilant concerning the things we believe, making sure that we trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not to our own understandings. And here we would also do well to remember another vital truth. For something to be true, it has to be completely true inject into it even the smallest falsehood, and we are left with a lie, one that is all the more powerful and deceptive because of its proximity to the real thing. We live in a time when cults are sprouting up everywhere and thriving like weeds. There are many reasons for this, the growth of moral relativism and multiculturalism, coupled with the explosion of information transfer technologies are among the more notable. But there is perhaps one preeminent reason, one that is completely the fault of the church. The Bible declares that the church is the pillar and buttress of the truth, a fortress that stands against the father of all lies, the evil deceiving spirit that ultimately stands behind every cult. Furthermore, Christians are called to be salt and light a people who can restrain sinful man's natural tendency towards spiritual decay and darkness. It's amazing what you can get Christians to do to fight moral evil. But they won't do that in the theological realm because they don't see that there is an ethical aspect 
of God's truth at that level.